and it will tell me that recording is in progress. So welcome, welcome. I think people are still kind of getting signed in here. So I'll just give it one more minute. And everybody feeling like they're getting signed in okay? You have a snack, you have a lunchtime, <laughs> a lunchtime meal here. Okay. All right, so one o'clock, this is PD part two, Parkinson's disease part two. My name is Dr. Karen Duncan. I'm one of the physicians here at Coeur d'Alene Healing Arts. Um, my focus in practice, other than general practice, practice for anybody with pediatric um, patients, is an integrative approach to neurology, neuro neurologic conditions. Um, so my training is specifically in Parkinson's disease. I've worked with Lori Mishley at Bastyr University, my alma mater, and am entering into my fourth year of clinical practice um, with this focus in Parkinson's. So if you were here with us or you watched the video from part one of Parkinson's, what I really want to do is kind of open up the discussion here for the first five, 10 minutes and see if anybody has a question about that. If we need to recap anything from that um, conversation, or again, this is an open forum. This is a service to our community. So while I um, start talking about um, PD part two and say, here's the topic for today. Also know that this is an open forum. This is here for you guys to ask questions and feel comfortable um, chatting as needed. So does anybody have any questions, concerns, complaints, anything they want to talk about from the first one, or just make sure that we're hitting on today so I can make a note of it? And again, as long as you're not sitting next to a bulldozer, you can you can keep your mute button off um, and participate um, as much as you want. Ask questions. All right. So pop quiz time. What is Parkinson's disease? Who wants to answer that question? Anyone? You guys in the wrong room? <laughs> it's a pain in the neck. There you go. Those are the answers I'm looking for. And the knees and the ankles. <laughs> and the knees and the ankles. Yeah. Uh, Parkinson's disease is in a motor, motor system degeneration category. Um, it's a movement disorder, um, neurologic condition. They call it neurodegenerative. And the fact that we lose our dopaminergic capability as we progress in the substantia nigra of our brain, which is the part of the brain that is responsible for motor movement. Um, Jody, are you able to hear me now? I know you had some troubles earlier. I want to make sure that if you're here, you can hear me. And you can unmute or you could type. Hopefully that worked out. So in the last um, open forum, we just kind of talked a little bit more about what Parkinson's disease is, what the diagnosis means, uh, what some of the most common symptoms are, both motor and non-motor. Um, and I think I beat that dead horse pretty, pretty well. I don't know if anybody was here for that first one. When I say by the time of diagnosis based on motor symptom onset, right? We, we classify it that way because we know now that we're too late to the game at the diagnosis. And people typically have had Parkinson's disease for up to 20 years prior to being diagnosis based on motor symptom onset, which again, for most people is a tremor, weakness, changes in handwriting, shuffling of gait. Um, things that would then indicate that we have something happening neurologically, but we recognize as we are 60 to 80% deplete of our dopaminergic neurons um, in that part of our brain by the time we are diagnosed. Um, so we're given the diagnosis of Parkinson's disease. Here's kind of initial therapies. Here's what you can expect from your symptom management. Here's who you want on your team. Um, here are some of the common non-motor non symptoms. And those are the things that we went over in part one. 
Um, does anybody want me to kind of dive into any of those for a few minutes or are we feeling pretty confident in going into management of and kind of what to expect as we progress? You speak now or forever hold your peace, right? <laughs> Just kidding. Um, we can always back up. We can always answer those questions. So really where I wanted to start with today is, is the field of pharmacology, which feels a little bit strange coming from a naturopathic doctor that I'm going to jump on here and talk about drugs, uh, right? But there are so many medicines out there that can be used to manage Parkinson's disease. And chances are, if you've had the diagnosis for more than five years, you have more than one medic medicine on board um, to manage your symptoms. And some of the most common ones that we initiate therapy with for our standard run-of-the-mill Parkinson's disease diagnosis is what's called dopaminergic, right? That's your carbidopa, levodopa, your cinnamon, your ritari, your parcopa, um, generic carbidopa, levodopa. So that that's kind of our initial monotherapy. And I always say, if you've listened to any of my other lectures, this is about as true form to a supplement as you can get right? Your body's not making dopamine anymore. So we're going to give it dopamine in the most natural form that we can actually create it is through this pharmaceutical um, delivery method. It's the most standardized, you know, tablet to tablet, bottle to bottle, um, and it is heavily regulated by the FDA. Um, why is it so important that we start on that early? Well, I alluded earlier that we're late to the diagnosis already. So we're dopamine deficient um, to an extreme amount by the time we get the diagnosis by motor symptom onset. So repleting your stores and giving the body dopamine to manage some of those motor and non-motor symptoms can be really effective. Um, Carbidopa levodopa has a lot of caveats to it, right? The very first thing that I want people to understand is that we have levodopa receptors all throughout our body. So when we put levodopa in the system, it could bind anywhere. And you're at a higher rate for uh, side effect if you do not pair it with the carbidopa. Also, we're not going to get as much as an effect where we want it to in the brain if it's binding somewhere else. So when we pair it with carbidopa, I like to say, think of carbidopa as the car or the shuttle bus to, to deliver the levodopa to the brain. Carbidopa cannot cross the blood-brain barrier, so therefore those two particles are attached, those two medicines are attached throughout the entire body, and then when it gets to the blood-brain barrier, the carbidopa releases the levodopa there. So we have a higher percentage um, of efficacy in the brain where we want it to be. Um, levodopa is the amino acid that gets into the brain and then is turned into dopamine through biochemical processes. Now, why is that important? It is an amino acid that then turns into L-dopamine in the brain, right? That's what we want to have in the system. There's a lot of things that happen in that space in between that I think is, is glossed over a lot, at least in the patients that I see. Can you convert it? Do you have the cofactors for those biochemical reactions? And we'll talk about some of those things here as we go on. But anytime I make a statement as this works like this, make sure that you know that it's the the start phase and the end phase are not this close together. There's this vast array of physiologic and biochemical obstacles that could be there that I think is part and parcel my job as a naturopath to say, are we addressing all of these to make sure that when we do give you the precursor amino acid, it is then converting into um, the dopamine in the brain. So that's typically where we start. Now, a lot of young onset people with Parkinson's, if you're diagnosed between the, before the age of 50, they'll actually start with like um, an anticholinergic medicine instead, just to manage the motor symptoms, um, because it is suspected that we don't have such a loss of dopaminergic neurons yet at that point in time. So typically um, the young onset population will start with a different pharmaceutical regimen um, than the majority of our, our older folks that are diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. Some of the common side, oh, go ahead, Rich. Good job, I didn't even catch that at first. Oh, uh, is there a short list of supplements that increase the absorption rate of carbidopa, levodopa? Did you mention lemon in the last couple of months? Or I something? did, yep, so acid. That's, that's really the, the primary and only one that I focus on for the absorption of. So because it's an amino acid, it is a protein precursor. We need acid in the stomach to break it down. 
And we make hydrochloric acid in the stomach because what it does is the acid doesn't necessarily break down the protein, but to a small effect, but the acid cleaves a, what's called a proenzyme that then breaks down into pepsin. So pepsinogen is released from some stomach cells. It gets broken into pepsin. And then pepsin is that enzyme that breaks up proteins in our body and helps enhance the absorption. So uh, I'm glad that you mentioned that a couple minutes later, but we can get right to it right now is that if we just take the carbidopa levodopa by itself, we're going to get an absorption rate that our, their gastric ability that we have individually. What is our gastric ability? Um, we take carbidopa, it's almost counterintuitive. We take it most likely in an empty stomach, right? Because we're told not to take it with protein. Um, protein will directly compete for absorption in the stomach. So we want to take it away from protein. So most people will take it on an empty stomach. Now, with what you know, knowing that we need hydrochloric acid and digestive enzymes to absorb it, but we want to also take it on an empty stomach, we can, I mean, Rich already gave us the answer, but can you see logically now why we need to supplement with vitamin C when we take our medicine for best absorption? Does that make sense to everybody? Yeah. If we're not preparing our body to eat, we're not going to make that acid and those digestive enzymes. So it doesn't really exist, but we need to take that away from food. So that's where we, yeah, we supplement with the, and again, you could use emergency packets if you don't have diabetes, because they have a little sugar in them. You could use lemon water. Um, you can take a buffered vitamin C with your levodopa dose to give the same acidity in the stomach to create that, that breakdown pathway um, for best absorption and therefore better efficacy. The second thing is, is instead of talking about how to enhance absorption, we already talked about protein, protein as inhibiting absorption, but the other, one of the most common nutraceuticals I see prescribed for people with Parkinson's because of their anxiety, because of their restless legs, because of it's a cofactor for a quadrillion biochemical reactions in the body, right? Is magnesium constipation. Anybody taking magnesium, right? We take magnesium. Yeah. <laughs> Two hands up. Thanks, Cheryl. Um, Magnesium and carbidopa levodopa, well, it will inhibit the absorption. So even though it's natural, even though it comes in a supplement bottle, even though it might be food grade, we really need to understand that not everything that comes in supplement form is safe, indicated, and um, I say benign, but doesn't interact with your medications. And this is where I do caution. If you're a patient of mine, you've heard my soapbox spiel over and over and over again. Please don't just go over the counter and get supplements willy nilly. Like magnesium comes in about 15 different forms and they each do 15 different things in the body and certain forms will inhibit the absorption of your medicine. So there really is a science to all of this and if you are somebody who has Parkinson's disease or you love somebody who has Parkinson's disease, in my opinion, it's worth it to either do the research or contact somebody like me that can say, here's what you need to take and how to take it because it, it's not always doing this benefit. I don't have a name over there. It says I Zoom user. So yeah, go ahead. You have a question, Pink Cat. Yes, my name is Nora. I don't know why my name is on there. Hi, Nora. Hi. <laughs> so I take magnesium for leg cramps so what what's the alternative you can still take magnesium it's my favorite prescribed nutraceutical just don't take it at the same time as your medicine and what form of magnesium do you recommend for leg cramps mm -hmm. i recommend magnesium glycinate malate and i'll write that in the in the text box there too so you can, oh that said glycin, glycinate my and, then, and then another reason to take it is constipation. Is that the same? No, and constipation <laughs> is magnesium oxide and citrate. Okay. So those are going to be two different, two different forms. So malate is for muscle spasticity. Glycinate calms the nervous system down. So those nervous signals. So that combination is a perfect combination for restless leg syndrome and for REM sleep disorder. It helps a lot with sleep and anxiety. Magnesium oxide and citrate are not well absorbed from the gut. We don't want them to be. So they stay in the gut, they pull water and they help poop come out. So those are different forms, but all of the forms of magnesium will interfere with your absorption of your medicine. So we want to avoid that, taking those together. And anytime I say avoid taking together, the train of thought is 30 minutes before, 60 minutes after. Um, now, when we're talking about food, it's a little bit different 
because if you have constipation, which is a very common non-motor symptom of Parkinson's disease, which technically I guess should be motor because those are all muscles in there moving, um, then that window can go up to two to four hours um, away from your meds with the constipation, um, with protein interference with your carbidopa levodopa. And that's just not sustainable. And, you know, I just had a, a conversation with that, a, a patient today is that taking your meds four hours away from food, not sustainable, right? When do you eat? When do you take meds? So then we really want to focus on your gut health, which we'll talk about here in a few minutes. So back to the carbidopa levodopa, right? Our kind of our primary dopamine replacement, if you will, supplement. I want you to think of it as an orange pill bottle. I want you to think of it as a supplement. My body cannot make this anymore. Therefore, I am taking it uh, exogenously outside. Um, I use the example all the time to patients who are hesitant, you know, type one diabetes, your pancreas isn't making insulin anymore. So we give you insulin. It is the most natural thing we can give your body. Common side effects of carbidopa levodopa, though, are really confusing because they can mimic non-motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease, meaning nausea, sleepiness, orthostatic hypotension, which means you get dizzy when you go from sitting to standing. And so if those are side effects, and we try to tease apart, are those side effects of your medicine, are those symptoms of Parkinson's disease? And if they end up in the side effects of medication component, then we can work with your dietary, you can take your medicine with applesauce, right? To reduce the nausea. We want to drink water with electrolytes to reduce that orthostatic hypotension. Oh, by the way, emergency C is an electrolyte powder that has the vitamin C and aids in the absorption of your carbidopa levodopa. So you get a twofer there. Um, if you get anything with some ginger, you can add that in there for nausea. So we try to combat those side effects in a very naturopathic way um, so that we don't have to add another uh, medicine on top of it because there are some anti-nausea medicines that interact with, with Parkinson's meds as well. Um, the carbidopa levodopa comes in a lot of different formulations. The most common one that we start with is that immediate release, 25 milligrams of carbidopa to 100 milligrams of levodopa. Um, and then we dose that appropriately in a taper up fashion. If you are new to Parkinson's disease and you were not tapered up on your carbidopa levodopa, I'm sorry. You, everybody who has Parkinson's should have been or should be tapered up on that medicine. We want to use the lowest possible dose to get the best reward without causing a over medication effect possible. Um, and more often than not, I get newly diagnosed people with Parkinson's in my office saying, yeah, I started off at two tabs three or four times a day right out of the get-go. And again, while that might be your therapeutic dose, it takes a while for your body to adjust from very little dopamine to a lot of dopamine all at once. And then we can suffer from these dyskinesias, if you call them, or the side effect of over-medication. There is out there a couple different forms of, of levodopa that I think it's interesting. There's something called parcopa out there. That's a orally, it disintegrates um, uh, in your mouth to, to help with people who have difficulty swallowing. A huge misconception out there is that it works even quicker than uh, an immediate release Studies show that it doesn't. I have many a patient who says, actually, it does. It kicks in a little bit faster. It's kind of used as a rescue dose. Um, if that's the case for that patient, then the very first thing I'm thinking is an obstacle for efficacy is the gut, right? If you're taking an orally oral medicine that's supposed to work as quick as a sublingual medicine and it doesn't, then your gut absorption capabilities might be diminished. And we're going to refocus our attention to, to your gut health. Um, they have also come up with, and then anybody have questions on Ritari? Is anybody on Ritari? That's another formulation of the carbidopa levodopa. I got a quick question about that. Is that, stuff, oh, yeah, is that any different than taking Cinemat? Is any different than just changing the dose? and the strength versus cinnamon? Ritari? Yeah. It is, so it's a different formulation. So it's a little trickier to manage the conversion if you're going back and forth. However, I have done that quite a few times. Typically, if somebody's not responding well to cinnamon or your standard cinnamon is um, brand, by the way, for carbidopa levodopa, if they're not responding well to that, then I'll switch them over to Ritari and vice versa. And what Ritari is, is it's a blended version of a controlled release and an immediate release, carbidopa levodopa. So they blended that together, which is why the dosing is in like 0.75 or 0.95 um, milligrams, because it's going to have that initial peak and it's going to have a controlled 
um, release extent. So I typically, what I see is when we have this, um, what am I calling it? Sundowning effect or somebody's not responding well to their cinemet or their carbidopa levodopa immediate release and they've hit max dose then that's a or they're taking it and they're getting these giant dyskinesias then that's a that's a patient that i'll consider changing over to ritari because what we see is a initial peak of efficacy at one hour after taking it and then lasting effects from four for four to five hours would that be something to sleep with these better sleep that can be helpful for sleep. So I am in the camp for sure um, of using an extended release or a controlled release carbidopa levodopa for sleep. And so that's an even longer efficacy rate in a short in a, in a shorter peak. So again, if, if you're a patient of mine, you see me do this many, many, many times. But when we take an extended release with an immediate release before bed, which I have seen to have really, really great results with patients, what we see is that this is our um immediate release, and this is our extended release, we tend to see this effect. Okay, I'm going to get this immediate response. When I'm going to bed, I get this kick of dopamine. As this is coming down through the night, my extended release is starting to ramp up, and then it's going to carry me through the night. So we see less REM sleep disorder, less you know writhing around in your sheets, better ability to go up and use the bathroom if you have that nighttime um, urination symptom. And then what I'm seeing in my practice is that when we use an extended release or controlled release through bedtime, our need for medicine during the day actually decreases. Because if we start in the morning feeling a little bit better, then we need less intervention to get us into that on period. Um, yeah. It's not always tolerated well, unfortunately. Um, it depends on where you are in the disease progression and how you respond. Um, but I would say I'm at about a 70, 30 success rate as far as people really responding well to a, a controlled release at bedtime and then waking up in the morning and not needing so much um, daytime medicine to carry them through. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so again, that kind of covers the, the levodopa. Now they also have a couple different levodopa forms, right? We can do embresia. If anybody's heard of embresia, it's an inhaled levodopa. This is not compounded with carbidopa levodopa. So we get a very, very quick spike of levodopa. Um, within 15 minutes of inhalation, we're seeing improvement in motor symptoms. And then it also fades out very quickly as well. Um, embresia, the reps will talk to me very, very frequently about using this as like monotherapy or control therapy, things like that. However, the best clinical use I can think of for embresia is we call it bridging the gap. If you're sitting there, I do not want to increase my medication dose or I'm at my max dose. And we're in this spot where we don't think your gut is absorbing well, then typically I'll use an embresia prescription to bridge the gap and bypass the gut. Okay. You're taking your cinema every four hours at hour three to three and a half. You're just joking and for your next dose, you're dipping down into off. We want to make sure that we get that hit of levodopa to carry us through to that next dose, because we really want to keep those symptoms plateaued through the day. We don't want to see this, this wave effect. Um, so that's, that's a different option um, to get your levodopa in there as well. And I really, really like embresia. Um, we do some of the negative side effects of that are just like with any inhaler, there's going to be a little cough, a dry throat, um, an intolerance. I have one woman, I actually had her in my office and we practice and practice and practice and just could not every single time it was this white puff of every time she took it and just, okay, I don't, I don't think you can do it, but to be quite honest, it's really well tolerated and very useful. And then again, it's one of those things, if you have it in your purse or your bag or your briefcase and you're going on a flight or you have something that you're going to do that causes high anxiety and it's not every day, it's something that you can get that little hit of levodopa in to help make it through that phase. Nora, you had another question? I do. Is there any word on the subcutaneous um continuous, whatever it's called. Are you They're, talking about the Duopa pump? The, that goes into the intestine? Yep. No, no, there's a new one that's supposed to like, works like uh, insulin does for diabetics. Yes, there is. Let me just look here because I have them all written down here. The subcutaneous levodopa trials, um, neuroderm, and then AbV. So as far as I do think one passed into 
a phase two, but I'm not, I am honestly not sure if they're on the market yet. I know that Jason Aldrin in our region is kind of the leading researcher for some of those pharmaceuticals, um, but that's not something I have prescribed yet. I'm kind of excited for that. I am too. I, I this it, With the amount that our gut health affects the medicine advocacy in people with Parkinson's, anything that can bypass um, yeah. absorption is okay, very helpful. Well. <laughs> we'll, keep, we'll keep up to speed on that one for sure. So the next class of any, any other, oh, go ahead, Julie. Hi, can you hear me? I can. Okay, great. Sorry, I don't have a camera available right now. That's I'm okay. just newly diagnosed and trying to start on the, the carbidopa levodopa. Mm -hmm. The problem that I've experienced is I take a half a dose twice a day, and now all of a sudden at night, I'm having these crazy leg just constant tension, cramping, uncramping in my, I've only had a tremor in my arm. So it, it sounds to me like I, I might not be having a favorable reaction to the drug, but I don't know. I was taking it. I'd only started for a week. And so, and I, the very beginning, you kind of faded out. I think I heard you say you were newly diagnosed. Yeah. So I started on half of a tablet AM and half of a tablet PM. And then after about five days is when my, I, I couldn't sleep at all because I was having all these crazy, like, I, I don't even know. It's like tensing, just constant muscle tensing, tensing of the legs. Yeah. Of just my left leg. So this is a challenging space because I want to offer medical advice, but I can't. Mm -hmm. But what I would say is it does sound like you could be, have a reaction to the medicine. And there's one of there's a couple different things that can happen. There's something called dyskinetic dyskinesia. Um, mm. And that's when you are kind of over medicated to the point where it sounds like you're getting like a, um, a pain or something like that to the medicine. But since you're on such a low dose, I mm -hmm. would think that it's more likely an adverse response to the medicine. Um, okay. So again, if you were my patient, I'd probably say, hey, take a few days off and see if that abates. And if it does kind of tackle that from a different way. Now, restless legs, cramping in the legs, we call that dystonia. That's not an unfamiliar or an uncommon symptom of Parkinson's as well. So that would also be something that that might be a reason that we talk about a magnesium glycinate malate supplement um, instead of doing another medicine, maybe doing a supplement to help with that symptom while you taper up into the medication. As it, like I mentioned before, I don't know if you were on from the beginning, but your body has to do a lot of adjusting um, when it brings on the carbidopa levodopa. Okay. So those are a few of the different ideas that I would have for you as you kind of navigate how to move forward with this. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah, no problem. What did you call that? Dis Dyskinetic dyskinesia. Dyskinetic. It's a bummer. It's like a, a double negative, right? Of a side effect from the medicine. Yeah. Um, and there are some medicines out there that actually can help with that. Um, but from what you were saying, Julie, it seems like you're too early and too low of a dose to feel like you needed to add therapies on rather, you know, kind of come back to square one and see if that's the correct avenue for you to be taking. Um, any questions on levodopa medicine? the dopaminergic, how are we going to, and again, if you think of your bloodstream, so, so when you think of, think of your bloodstream as this, you know, bucket that's depleted of dopamine, I'm going to talk about all the different ways we get more dopamine in it. That essentially is just dumping more into the bucket, right? We're just adding dopamine into your, into your bucket. Um, the next class of medicine is called dopamine agonist. And if you're a patient of mine, you know that these are my least favorite, um, but they are quite effective for what they do. Um, dopamine agonists, the medicines that are involved in this family are ropinirole or Requip, Pramipexol or Mirapex, and Ritigotine. No idea if I pronounced that correctly ever, but that's new pro, that's the patch. Um, what these do, these are dopamine agonists, so they, they, they bind to the dopamine receptors in your body so that your body thinks you have more dopamine. So you have your bucket, we want more dopamine in it, but this medicine isn't adding more dopamine to the bucket. It's just making your body feel like you have more dopamine in the bucket. So it will react to that biochemical stimulation on the receptor 
as if you had more dopamine. Um, can be really, really effective for some folks. Again, this is more commonly used for some of our YLPDs. Um, and then some people who can't tolerate the dopaminergic medicine will go into a dopamine agonist. Um, dopamine agonist side effects, the most common one that I see and the most concerning one is compulsive behaviors. Um, we see gambling, we see um, spending a lot of money. I see a lot of porn addiction. Um, there's a lot of different ways that we can satisfy that dopamine hit, if you will, um, and sometimes that leads to a, a compulsive behaviors. Um, we also see cognitive mood or behavioral changes is more uh, likely with this medicine than a levodopa. And we talked about impulse control disorders, uh, visual hallucinations, daytime somnolence, or some people call them sleep attacks, just I'm sleepy. So that can be a really scary side effect for somebody who's still working or um, functioning in a way that they need to be awake during the day, um, swelling of the legs, and then again, orthostatic hypotension. So that dizziness feeling when you go from sitting to standing. In my practice, this is one of the last measures that I take to manage Parkinson's symptoms. Uh, the next class of medicine is called MAOB inhibitor. So again, here's our bucket, here's our dopamine. Of course, with everything in the body, we get, we make some and then we break it down, right? It's dopamine is this transient period in our bloodstream of being produced and being broken down. And what MAOB does in, in blocking it is instead of the, the dopamine in your bloodstream um, being broken down to get released into the next transmitter, this inhibits that enzyme to break it down. So we keep more in the bucket so it doesn't leave. Um, the medicines there in this class is selegiline, risagiline, safinamide, and zanisamide. Um, those are all MAOB inhibitors. So those, again, inhibit the breakdown of dopamine to keep our bucket more full. Um, the really fascinating fact about this medicine is that risagiline has been, or Azelect as a brand, is the only medicine on the market to show a very, very slight positive effect on the progression of the disease. All of our pharmaceutical medications to date have not affected the progression of Parkinson's disease. They really all address the symptoms of in management. So risagiline is one of those prescriptions that I write for damn near every patient that walks in my door. If you can tolerate it, we want you on this medicine because we want a slow progression of the disease. Another fun fact about that is turmeric, um, curcumin, the spice, um, actually has MAOB type um, effects in it. So one of the most common nutraceutical prescriptions that I will recommend for people with Parkinson's is a compound with turmeric in it. Um, the next class of medicine is called COMP-T inhibitors and COMT or COMP-T is another enzyme that's responsible for the breakdown um, of dopamine. So keeping that bucket full by inhibiting the breakdown. Um, but really we want to give this with levodopa. And the reason that we use this class of medicine, which is intacopone or apicopone, if either of any of you are on those medicines, is to enhance the efficacy of your medicine. So unlike an MAOB inhibitor that's going to go into your bloodstream and just try to keep dopamine there, we give a COMT inhibitor to when we take our levodopa, because we're going to give them together. So we're going to give the levodopa and then give the medicine to keep that levodopa from metabolizing. So we want to keep that in the system longer. Um, these are very, very effective medicines. Um, I rely heavily on a COMT inhibitor uh, for folks who, again, are close to max dosing on their carbidopa, levodopa. They see wonderful effects, but they start saying, oh my gosh, I feel like now I need it every two to three hours instead of every four to five hours. This is a pharmaceutical that I'll turn to pretty quickly in that scenario. Um, the other thing to keep in mind from a naturopathic perspective is that citicoline, which is a naturally occurring fatty acid, is also known to enhance the efficacy of your pharmaceutical. Um, citicoline in clinical studies has been shown to enhance the efficacy of carbidopa levodopa by 30% in 30 days. And so when I prescribe this, typically it's in a synergistic blend. Um, and I have two different forms of that here. Again, I have no conflicts of interest. I just have things that help people. I don't get paid for it. <laughs> um, but integrative therapeutics makes, and there's citicoline straight on the market there. 
but these blends are really phenomenal. This one is my favorite. It's Pro Thrivers Wellness Brain, and it's got your lion's mane mushroom in there for cognition and neurologic health. It's got your acetyl L-carnitine, which is excellent for your mitochondrial support. It's got the citicoline at therapeutic dose, and then it has a little theracurmin or the turmeric to act as an MAOB. So this is a really great formula. I also like the neurologics. This has acetylcholine in it. This is something that I'll use for somebody who's a little bit more um, having difficulties focusing, some ADD, maybe some cognitive changes, maybe really high in anxiety. Um, this is as your B6. It has spearmint or mentha saffron and then the acetylcholine. So this is more of a calming um, neurologic supplement. So a little less used um, in the Parkinson's community just because of the benefits of the, of the prothrivers. But I just like people to know, as we're talking about pharmacotherapy, you know, looking at these natural medicines and how they can help um, meet some of the same goals that we're looking for in management of Parkinson's disease with a lower side effect profile is really beneficial. Um, years and years ago, in retrospective studies, we recognized that coffee consumption was actually protective or decreased the risk of Parkinson's disease, which helped me rationalize having my, you know, two cups of coffee a day. <laughs> um, but really what coffee is, is we call it an adenosine receptor antagonist. So we wanted to mimic that biochemistry with what coffee was doing in the body uh, in a medical way. And so there's a medicine out there called estradiphylene or neurians, and that works as an adenosine receptor antagonist. And that had, can show some improvement when people are having off episodes. So this is a treatment that's utilized just to treat that off episode. Um, we want to decrease that dyskinesia or that unwanted movement or symptom um, picture um, after taking their medicine if they feel like they're over medicated. I also recommend coffee. Um, that's a very natural one. So we've gone through most of the common um, amantadine. Uh, I did want to hear, hit on amantadine um, before I kind of move into the next phase. Uh, amantadine and remantadine were a couple of drugs that are actually developed um, to prevent the flu. Uh, but what we notice in there is that they improved the mild motor symptoms associated with dyskinesia. So that over medication side effect. So to kind of go back to, to Julie's question and other medicines that are used for, you know, dyskinesias or over medication saying, hey, we're, we're stuck here. We want to use this amount so we don't feel off, but then we're really easy to tip over into the dyskinetic or over medicated bucket. Amantadine can help um, reduce uh, that dyskinetic propensity. Um, unfortunately, some side effects of amantadine are lower extremity swelling, confusion, hallucinations, behavioral changes, and then something called levito reticularis. And that's where we see this like lacy like webbing of your, of your blood vessels under your skin. Um, so again, there's going to be pros and cons to every pharmaceutical, um, in my office and in my clinical practice, I have the benefit and the gift of being an integrated provider. So being able to navigate those pharmaceuticals, know which ones are indicated, understand timing and, you know, biochemistry of them, but then also recognizing how can we mimic some of this? How can we utilize some of these actions and then recognize what's happening in your body as a whole to say, is there something else we can be doing either to mitigate the side effects? or decrease the necessity um, for pharmaceuticals altogether. So that's really where I kind of wanted to move into um, for the second part of this conversation. So we only got about five or 10 minutes left. Unless anybody has any questions on pharmacologic management of PD. Okay, so... I'm going to put on my strictly naturopathic hat here for a minute and say you, this is part two of Parkinson's disease. And, and, and Julie, I just, I really appreciate you being here because you're giving me the opportunity to say something that I don't get to say that often in a public forum. And that is welcome. Parkinson's disease is not something anybody sits and writes in their diary saying, this is really what I hope to have. But anybody in the Zoom space, I hope the ones, you know, if you can see any of us, Julie, I hope you can see the nodding and feel the love of any of the communities of diagnostics to be a part of as we grow older. Um, this one kicks ass. 
the, the people, the community, the love, the support, everything about the Parkinson's community. I mean, it's why I chose this as a field. Um, and it's one of the very first things that I recommend to people is if you get the diagnosis of Parkinson's or know somebody who does tap in, tap into it, go all in both feet deep end, because the amount of support that you're going to get through this far exceeds whatever you're going to get with your doctor in their office. And that's hopefully, hopefully you can recognize that. Um, and, and feel that moving forward. Um, the Northwest Parkinson's Foundation is a huge and phenomenal resource for people with Parkinson's. Um, there are support groups if you're local to the area. I know there's support groups up in Anchorage. I just went up there and met a bunch of great folks up there in Alaska. Alice, you can get a little shout out there. Um, here in um, Idaho and in the inland Northwest, um, they're just smattered all over the place. So getting involved and finding a community um, near you what we learned, we were studying before the pandemic, and then it was really solidified through the research done through the COVID pandemic, is that isolation and loneliness is a more, is a higher predictor of disease progression than anything else combined. And so what does that mean for us nerd brains who are researching this? You could do exercise, you could do diet, you could take all the pharmaceuticals and the disease will progress at the rate that it will. However, if you are lonely and isolated, that will negatively trump all those positive lifestyle changes. And so loneliness isn't, you know, reserved for people who are physically alone. This is, I feel alone in my marriage. My family doesn't understand. I don't have a friend group who understands, you know, there's, there's a lot of different ways to feel isolated and what we have learned, like I said, unfortunately through the pandemic, but in a way that makes me get on my soapbox even greater is that, even if you're not one of those people, which a lot of people, I'm not one of those people that go to support groups. I'm not, I'm not one of those people. <laughs> um, get involved in some way, shape, or form um, because that community and understanding is not just beneficial as humans um, who are people of collect, connection and belonging, um, but also for the disease progression. And again, we have, we've now seen that in the clinical research. Um, so getting into that symptomatic treatment cannot be overlooked, making sure that you're getting on medicines to help with the symptoms. I mean, if balance and tremor and slowness and apathy and depression are all symptoms of Parkinson's disease that are interfering with your ability to do all of the things that we need to do to slow progression, then we need symptomatic treatment. So that's where that medicine really comes on board. Um, and then we know exercise. We, I mean, we've had that beat into our brains. I have neurologists now who I just want to go hug because I'll get a, a newly diagnosed people, person with Parkinson's and they're like, they didn't even put me on meds. They just gave me an exercise regimen. I'm like, oh, this is so exciting that we're actually starting earlier than saying this is disease modifying medication is exercise. And the really important thing to know about exercise is it's dose and frequency dependent. It does matter if you do it three days a week versus five days a week versus seven days a week. If you exercise less than three days a week, it does not have an effect on the progression of your disease. And then the more you do it, the better effect it has. Now that's to a certain point, right? If you have tolerance, if you have pain, if you have balance issues, if you're a fall risk, we don't want you pushing yourself to the point where you're going to injure yourself in an effort to slow the disease progression. Um, so those, those two things are like the hallmarks there. Now, under those two things, I'm going to say one word that anybody who's a patient of mine has heard me say over and over and over and over again. And I even joke with my husband and say, I am the highest paid physician. It's not that high, but highest paid person on the planet, probably that tells people to drink water. Your brain is floating in water. Your joints need fluid. Your blood pressure needs fluid. Your body needs electrolytes. There is also, because we're such nerds, a research study, thank you, Rich, that actually shows that people with Parkinson's have a less, a lessening of their thirst cue. People feel thirsty less if you have Parkinson's disease. And whether that's because of the lower hydrochloric acid or whatever the case may be, if you're thirsty less, then you're not going to drink water as much. So it affects your blood pressure, that hypotension. It affects your brain function, if oxidative stress, detoxification. And oh, by the way, the most common non-motor symptom that's out there is the inability to poop, which requires water. So I can't tell everybody enough to drink water. 
and again, I mean, people who come to my office for years and years and years, it is a question I will ask you every single time you come in here. And if you're not drinking water, we will refocus the conversation to that first. Nothing will improve if we don't stay hydrated in our bodies. Now, the benefit of Parkinson's disease and taking emergency with your electrolytes and your vitamin C to enhance efficacy and to help with the orthostatic hypotension is that electrolytes turns your body into a sponge. So now we don't have that urinary urgency and frequency because we're drinking way more water because Dr. Karen told us to. But when we add electrolytes, now we're actually turning that body into a sponge. So we're absorbing it better and actually improves those urinary symptoms. So really, really want to kind of pound that one in. Dietary shifts and changes for people with Parkinson's includes avoiding dairy um, and avoiding, what's the other one I want to say? Just ran out of my brain. Come on, who's my patient? What did I tell you to avoid? Red meat. Red meat's on the list, yeah. Pork, pork. Pork's on the list. What's that? Sugar, sugar's on the list, added sugar. No. Processed sure. food. Yeah, so there's a whole table if you're interested in seeing the kind of the progression one that talks about the top, you know, five, 10 foods to avoid, the top five, 10 foods to focus on. Um, if you've ever been a patient of mine, you have a very long list um, of dietary goals and foods to really focus on. Um, but dairy is the big one uh, for a lot of different reasons. But we know people who consume high levels of dairy are at higher risk for developing Parkinson's disease. We also know people who consume high amounts of dairy are at higher risk for faster progression of Parkinson's disease. So when I first started off in my practice, I was doing a podcast with Ben Whites a while ago, and I kind of joked, but when I first started practice, you know, it's hard to take away somebody's favorite food. It is not fun. It is not fun at all to say no cheese, no ice cream. These, I know these are your favorites, but you know, I, so I gently would go in and say, you know, let's start, let's shift, let's think about it. Um, I'd like to think I'm still nice, but I'm a little more firm. Be like, yo, what does it mean to you to have dairy? And how can we get it out? And just done. I, I don't want to dwell on this. We have the data. It's as clear to say, hey, somebody with cirrhosis of the liver should not be drinking alcohol, right? I mean, it's a disservice for me to say, go ahead and take your time getting rid of dairy, right? This is just bad, bad news bears. We know it for a fact. Everything else dietarily really shifts in the direction of if I give you enough goals to eat what you should be getting into your daily diet, then everything else kind of falls into place naturally in a way that says, okay, if this is what my grocery list is, then I'm avoiding that just by, by natural elimination. Um, but dairy is one that we really want to make an intentional effort to, to avoid. Where can we find that list? Of foods to eat? Yeah. Um, those are, if you are a patient of mine, it should be in your very first visit note. And then multiple times thereafter, we talk about dietary goals. Yes, Rich. In terms of a recommended electrolyte, did you once recommend one called NUUN? And if so, what would be the recommended dose? I did. I recommend them called uh, NUUN. I pronounce it noon. Everybody, somebody said noon. And I was like, oh, I don't even know if I can make that word noon, the W. Uh, but yeah, NUUN. The reason that I like them is they're little tablets. Um, I usually, I always have some. There they are. They come in a bunch of different flavors. They're in little containers like this. And then they're effervescent, not even effervescent. They just dissolve in your water and yeah. potent, potentize it with electrolytes. Um, what I do is very first and foremost, this is not medical advice. If you have a cardiovascular or kidney or liver disease, do not follow any water drinking recommendations without talking to your doctor. So I have to have my disclaimer out there. Um, if you do not, then my recommendation is water intake should be about half of your body weight in ounces of water. So if you weigh 160 pounds, you should be getting 80 ounces of water a day. And then I say half of that water intake should be with electrolytes in it. So 40 ounces with electrolytes added to it. At the very least, I recommend bookending. So your very first fluid intake of the day should not be coffee, even though it isn't a denosine receptor antagonist. It should be water with electrolytes. Prioritize that bookend, beginning and end. Water with electrolytes is going to stable your blood pressure. Your movement is going to give you energy, brain clarity. Um, it helps with metabolism. Again, it gets that first dose of cinnamon in effectively if you have your vitamin C in it. 
And then that last dose of water, ironically enough, is going to help reduce nighttime urination wakings, that urgency frequency. It can help with sleep. It can help with, again, getting that last dose of cinnamon in an effective um, in a way that's necessary for you. So that's at the very least, I call them bookends. Get those bookends in first thing in the morning, last wash water intake at night. Yes, Nora. Um, when you say liver, is fatty liver, fatty liver, what you mean? Um, no? It depends on the severity. So I won't make you divulge everything if that's you. Um, there are many liver and kidney conditions that actually cause you to restrict your water intake so we don't overload you. So if you're having fluids or you're on a diuretic, um, those are reasons that you would not want to listen to water recommendation um, but from it, just anybody. But if you were told you had fatty liver and it's nothing to worry about. Then I would give you two answers to that question. Fatty liver can inhibit your liver function. It's not something that I want to worry about in a startling effect, but it's something that I would run reverse um, for said patient. And two, yes, you can follow water recommendations here. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, other nutraceuticals that I want to hit on in the next three minutes, it's going to be kind of fast and furious, but it's relatively simple, I think, to go on is as the progression goes. We want to talk about, you know, the gut health. I just can't be gut health in as, in as, as much as I can. As we age, we lose our ability to absorb. We lose intrinsic factor, which absorbs our B12. We lose our gastric secretions, which give us the hydrochloric acid, which break down our proteins and our medicine. Um, things slow down both as we age and with Parkinson's disease. So we're more prone to conditions like SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, other dysbiosis of the gut, IBS, constipation. So that gut health factor, if you feel like somebody's adding medicine on too fast and you're needing more and more and more, then my very first question is, are you even getting it? Are you absorbing it? If we have to keep piling things on to manage and you're not seeing the results, then is there an obstacle to cure here? On the nutraceutical front, um, the three natural medicines that I would say 99% of people with Parkinson's get on their initial visit with me is one glutathione. I think we talked about that in part one, which remind me if I'm mistaken there, um, CoQ10 and fish oil. So glutathione is the primary antioxidant of the brain. What we do know is by the time of diagnosis of Parkinson's disease, by motor symptom onset, and we are 80% deplete of our dopaminergic neurons, we're also 40 to 60% deplete of glutathione. So in short, if our neurons are dying and they're releasing debris into the local area and that debris is causing oxidative stress to the nearby dopaminergic neuron, causing it then to die, we have this domino effect and the glutathione would be the dump truck to carry away the debris and that's not there. Now we're looking at a domino effect and a neurodegenerative disease that could be slowed by the use of this nutraceutical. Studies and clinical trials date back to the late 70s of the efficacy of glutathione and Parkinson's disease. I do not know why it is not bigger. I don't know why it's not everywhere, but it's not, but it's here. We do it for everyone for the most part. Um, CoQ10 is a necessary cofactor for what's called the Krebs cycle or the mitochondrial energy producing cycle. Your mitochondria or the energy producing powerhouses of your cells are working hard. You have a movement disorder. Therefore, you are moving through energy faster than I am, even if we're just sitting here. So CoQ10 is essentially putting enough gas in your tank needed for you to function at the metabolic rate that you are with a movement disorder. And it helps enhance quality of life and support our cellular processes at a, at a, at a very deep um, level. Um, there's even theories, of course, if you're out there about Parkinson's disease being a mitochondrial disease, and that's a whole different lecture. Um, fish oil, high potency DHA. When you're looking at fish oils over the counter, the only two ingredients that matter are EPA and DHA. We're not looking at all these other omega-3s or fatty acids or all these other acronyms, we're looking at the content of EPA and DHA. DHA of the omega-3 fatty acids is the primary one in our brain. That's the one that we want to be supplementing. And we look for two to four grams with no other concomitant diagnoses. Now, if somebody does have fatty liver, <clears throat> as clinical trials have shown that four grams of high potency fish oil, EPA and DHA have been shown to reverse that. 
Um, keep in mind that fish oil is a mild blood thinner. So if you're on a blood thinner or you have a cardiovascular concern or you're going into surgery, you need to talk to your doctor first. So those are the three primary nutraceuticals that are going to be prescribed in my office. Now, the next one is if you're on cinnamon and long-term use of carbidopa levodopa, we do know that it depletes your body of B12. So we want to replete your body with B12. It's a really, really necessary nutrient for your nervous system. Lithium is a cofactor at physiologic doses for something called BDNF or brain-derived neurotropic factor. It's how we make new neurons. It's the, the foundation of neuroplasticity. How do we relearn how to do things? And lithium is a cofactor for that. There was even a push in the 80s to lithiumate the water in the Pacific Northwest because it was shown to be so deficient as a mineral. So these are all tests that you can have run. These are all nutrients that you can add in that safely. Um, and yes. there are all ways that we can help with the symptoms of Parkinson's disease without always turning to a pharmacologic agent. Is the lithium you're mentioning different from the lithium they give for mental problems? It's just a different dose. So that's, oh. you'll get the side eye from a lot of people when you talk about lithium <laughs> and there's other ones too, um, that you'll be like, people are like, what? At a pharmacologic dose, at a very high dose of lithium, they use it to treat bipolar disorder. At a yeah. physiologic dose, just like we use magnesium, calcium, zinc, copper, right? In our multivitamins, lithium is really effective for our body to carry on biochemical functions. Oh. It actually has been stigmatized so much so because it's used in the mental health world that they don't add it to a multivitamin anymore. So it is an essential mineral in our body. It is deplete in our body, just similarly to the other ones, but we don't have access to it. So yes, it is something that I prescribe readily and safely to, to patients who and, need it. And is B12 um, good to take orally or do you need the shot? It depends on if you can absorb it and it depends on which form. So B12 is a really, really hot topic in the world of Parkinson's disease. Um, and that does require individual care because some people cannot methylate their B12, which means they can't use it downstream, even though their blood levels will be high. So their primary care doctors will be like, you don't need any more, but if you can't use it, so we have to look at other markers like MMA, methylmalonic acid, or homocysteine. Um, and then also recognizing that, again, as we age, we have a less uh, lesser ability to absorb some of these nutrients. Therefore, we need to get them in a different way, which would bypass your gut. So either shots or sublingual. Go ahead, Rich. You have to worry about taking too much uh, of the B vitamins, or are they just water soluble and not dangerous? No, you really do. That's a really good question. They are water soluble, but you can get to toxic levels. The one I see most often is actually B6. Um, so some symptoms of Parkinson's disease that some people will have a peripheral neuropathy, and that can be a common side effect of medications as well. So people will often be on high, high doses of B vitamins. And unfortunately, I see that a lot in my community of naturopaths putting people on really, really high doses of B vitamins. But a, a B6 toxicity can actually cause neuropathic pain. Um, so we really want to be cautious of, of dosing appropriately and making sure that you have them in the correct amount. But a regular daily vitamin should not exceed that amount unless we can't process it out or break it down. But I have seen, I would say probably in the last two months, at least five cases of B6 toxicity. Oh. So it's not uncommon. So what's the recommended, the highest recommended daily dose for B6? That's a really good question. I don't know that off the top of my head. I find that out based on symptom picture by the patient, what they're taking, and then we run a blood lab value to see if their blood's too high. If Patients are going to come see you for the first time. Do you recommend they have blood labs? It would be lovely if they did. Rarely do they ever come to me with a comprehensive enough panel that I want to see just because insurance doesn't typically cover some of the more investigative labs. But a start, like a basic blood panel is always ideal. And then we can complement that. Otherwise I do, because we don't take insurance. I do work really well with people's primaries and I create what's called a wish list. And then if your primary will run as many as they possibly can, and I include rationale for all of them to these docs, here's why I need to see them for this person with Parkinson's, any, you know, three or four that they leave out for whatever reason, I can order then to supplement blood, but it is nice to have that ahead of time. Great. Not necessary though. 
Hey, we went like 10 minutes over, which is totally fine. Um, I know that I went really fast. This is recorded though. So you can always jump back on and like slow down the playback speed um, or rewind it a bunch of times and curse at me in the meantime. Um, as always in these open forums, you guys, you can send a message to the clinic. Um, you can info at CDAE Healing Arts. I'm gonna write this in the chat box. Oh gosh. Friday, right? Um, and CC me on there and just say, hey, I have a question for Karen after the open forum and I'll, I'll definitely get around to it. Those do have a week long buffer time because I'm also running a clinical practice. Um, but you can always send messages, ask questions, you know, sign up for an appointment, do a lab review, whatever, whatever feels good for you. Um, but you know, this information is out there for you guys. If you go to our website, www.cdahealingarts.com and you want more information from me, if you go to our team, I think about our team, scroll down to my profile, and then there's a link there for a library of resources and podcasts. You can click there. I have one just on lab reviews. I have one on gut health and PD. I have I don't know, Cheryl could probably tell you all the, the things I talk about over and over and over again, but <laughs> there's a bunch of lectures and, and podcasts and recordings there that you can look at for more information as well. Thank you for being here. Thank you for turning on your videos. You guys made my day because typically I will talk to a black screen and it's awkward. Um, and like I said, stay connected. Um, I'm going to leave the meeting here, but again, if anybody heard anybody else in the meeting that they want to connect mm -hmm. with, um, please use our office as a connecting point. We want to be a resource for people to get together mm -hmm. and find support and all that, all that good stuff. So thank you very, very much. I appreciate all the thank information. You. Thank you. Thank you. We'll all. chat with you all soon. Bye now. Thank you, thank Dr. You. Karen. Thank you, Karen, Dr. How, Karen. Hi. Karen, how can we get on the email list to be able to attend all of your webinars and sort of be notified about that. Is there a setup for that? Yeah, if you call our front office, let's see here, 208. So I did call the office and they said, just wait for an email and then it never came. If you're not an, are you an established patient here? Not yet, no. So if you're not an established patient, you're probably not on the distribution list. But if you want to be on the district list without being a patient, you'd have to call and say, I'm not a patient yet, but I want to be added to the email list. And they should be able to do that. Great. But they probably just figured you were a patient and said, you'll get emails. Yeah, that sounds right. The other thing is uh, social media. We just got an excellent administrative gal here who is young and on top of social media. So if you're on Facebook or Instagram, we're becoming more and more active there. Um, I don't like being addicted to social media for anybody, but I do think it's a really excellent resource to stay connected. And for our clinic specifically, it's more than just when we're having events. It's here's a resource. Here's what's happening wellness Wednesdays, fun facts, things like that. So it'd be a good, a good page to follow. Good. Thank you. Of course. Take care, everyone. All right. Bye. Bye.